boards should really be using mandatory climate reporting as a catalyst to reassess their organizational climate strategy, their level of ambition, and really taking a strategic rather than compliance-based focus while managing their liability risk. Welcome to The Green Away. I'm your host, Rosemary Petrus, Senior Journalist at FS Sustainability. We are recording on Gadigal land. We pay our respects to traditional custodians of country and elders past, present and emerging. Last week, we heard from the Investor Group on Climate Change all about how to maintain competitive advantage in Australia's new mandatory climate reporting regime. This week, we continue on the topic of climate disclosures, but from a board perspective this time. We'll also discuss how boards handle shareholder activism and ESG risks more broadly. We have two guests on the show this week, both from the Australian Institute of Company Directors, which is a member-based organisation all about improving governance. Mark Rigotti is Managing Director and CEO. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you for having me, Rose. And we also have Senior Policy Advisor, Anna Goodkoff. Welcome, Anna. Great to be here. Thanks, Rose. To kick things off, Mark, I want to ask you from your perspective of having been on numerous boards, as well as having come from a legal background advising financial sector clients, what is the relationship between boards and investors? And have you seen any evolution over time as sustainability and ESG rises in importance? Yeah, thanks, Rose. It's a good scene setting question. And I think that the starting point is that over recent years, we've seen an expanded range of issues, obligations, and regulatory requirements that boards have to think about, things like cyber, but increasingly ESG issues like climate. And it's within that general kind of direction that it's useful to think about the current focus of boards around mandatory climate reporting. One of the rules of thumb that we talk about at the AICD is helping directors take a long-term view and not just be buffeted by short-term interests. And they're in a unique position to do that. Uh, rather than management who might have short-term pressures on them, running the business, being profitable, those sorts of things. And that actually plays in very well with the ESG agenda, in particular with climate, being able to take that longer-term view. And we think that that's actually going to be really relevant when companies and their boards have to start complying with the mandatory climate reporting regime from January next year, depending on how big you are. There's a phase in between different size companies taking that long-term view, so not to just see it as a short-term compliance exercise, but to look at it through the longer-term view of strategy, alignment to investor needs, alignment to community expectations, and hopefully to creation of value. Talking about more broader ESG risks, what kind of specific obligations does a company director have? Yeah, good question. I think that the starting point here is just as a, a little reminder that directors have general duties. They have duties to act with due care and diligence and to act in the best interests of the company. And that applies across the array of different ESG issues, including climate. So there is that general setting. And we think that that applies to a director's obligation to sign off on climate disclosures, uh, for example. And there's a pretty important implication to that when you think about it. The implication is, is that directors will increasingly have to become climate literate. In the same way, there's an expectation they are financially literate. They can read a profit and loss statement. They can understand how the the company works and how it makes money or how it might lose money. Increasingly, we think there'll be a need for climate literacy. And so I think a lot of that is is coming. It's in in train. On climate also, their duties are, there's, there's an emerging area around how much you say and what you say and how you say it. And the risk there is if you say too much and don't have evidence to back it up, your company and you could be in trouble in terms of greenwashing and actually saying things that aren't supportable. So there's a couple of things there. One will be sign off on the disclosures, but secondly, making sure the disclosures are supportable. Of course, the AICD recently put out a guide for directors on mandatory climate reporting. And Anna, you're a specialist in this area. How are boards preparing for the new laws? What obligations are they going to have? Thanks, Rose. Um, Yes, so the mandatory climate reporting legislation was passed uh, by both Houses of Parliament and received royal assent earlier this month. And as Mark said, the first companies are required to start disclosing for the period commencing 1st of January 2025. Uh, So it's an exciting development, um, but it will require significant upskilling exercise 
and and ASIC chair Joe Longo is really referring to this as the biggest change to corporate reporting in a generation, and that upskilling will apply, including at the board level. Uh, and so what, what I might do is I might talk through a bit of the detail of what will be required first, and then I'll shift to some tips for how boards can prepare. So in terms of, of what, what the obligations are, the legislation applies to those entities that are currently already lodging financial reports um, and also um, companies which meet three uh, revenue asset and employee size thresholds. And as, as Mark said, it takes a staged approach or a phased approach with the largest emitters and corporations equivalent to around the ASX 200 disclosing first from 1st of January 2025 and then smaller group entities phased in from 1st of July 2026 and 1st of July 2027. Uh, and in terms of what they actually are required to disclose, disclosure will be required in line with a specific climate disclosure standard, and that was modelled on the international standard. And it really requires governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets disclosures. As Mark said, directors will also be required to make a declaration that in the director's opinion, um, the sustainability report complies with the legislation and the requirements. And and to be clear, it, the requirements are for annual disclosures in a standalone sustainability report. So that, that forms part of your annual reporting suite. Those disclosures will also be subject to mandatory assurance. Um, and there will be a phase in for that as well, starting with limited assurance progressing to reasonable. I think critically in terms of the consequences of not complying and what the obligations are, a failure to retain sustainability records and make the sustainability report publicly available uh, after lodgement with ASIC will attract civil penalties. And I think something to really raise awareness of and, and something that the AICD strongly advocated for is that within the legislation, there is a period of three years of a modified liability period, which provides for regulator-only enforcement over the most uncertain disclosures. And they, they include all forward-looking disclosures for the first year, and then scope three scenario analysis and transition planning disclosures for the first three years. And just touching on, I guess, the next part of the question, which is how boards can prepare. I think that the overarching uh, position is that boards should really be using mandatory climate reporting as a catalyst to reassess their organizational climate strategy, their level of ambition, and really taking a strategic rather than compliance-based focus while managing their liability risk. So in terms of, of, of three key actions that boards can take, the first is, is to review your existing governance structures to confirm that there is adequate competency and expertise to implement the new requirements. So making sure that you have clear lines of accountability. Increasingly, boards are using sustainability committees, for instance, and that allows more focused board time and sustainability issues. But of course, boards need to be aware that they have to sign off on these disclosures. So the full board review of the disclosures is necessary. The second is to undertake a gap analysis between what you are currently saying and doing on climate and what is required by their regime. And I think it's important to really realize that it's not just your formal climate disclosures, but also your website, investor presentations and social media disclosures. So everything needs to be consistent. And also thinking about how you are disclosing in the financial statements and the financial implications of the climate disclosures. I think having the finance team involved and early involvement with the C of the CFO will be increasingly important as well. And I think finally, having a clear plan on what the organization needs to do to get ready. So what resources do you have? Where do you need to upskill? Making sure that your board has um, an understanding of climate issues and the AICD that does have some short courses and e-learning on that. And we also have a guide, as you say. And then finally, making sure you have adequate investment prioritization and business support. Turning to shareholder activism now, Mark, we've seen a number of high profile instances recently in relation to climate and other ESG issues. How do boards deal with these situations? Thanks, Rose. Yes, there's been a general move towards greater shareholder and broader stakeholder activism and interest in the companies and the businesses of which they invest. And what that has led to has seen boards raise their ambition on key ESG issues. And I think actually shareholder and stakeholder consideration is now feeding into the way in which boards carry out their job. And it's very much moved from a, we will inform you uh, posture to one which is much more genuine two-way engagement. 
but it's a challenge because not all shareholders, not all stakeholders want the same thing. And that's when you see shareholder activism come to the fore in terms of both public um, battles or even litigation sometimes. Uh, some short-term investors will want financial gains to be maximised. Some longer-term investors will want ESG well and truly tackled in the context of the company. So it's a hard balance for boards to strike. The one practical tip we would give to directors is to listen, is to engage, is not to ignore the stakeholders, but to actually engage with them. And we saw this recently in the BHP situation where some shareholders raised some concerns around their, uh, their steel supply chain and value chain and BHP listened and some resolutions which were going to be put at the annual general meeting by those two shareholders were withdrawn because they were satisfied with the plans that BHP came up with. So listen and, um, and make sure you're engaging is the main message. Thank you both so much for your time today. Where can people find the courses, the other professional development opportunities you offer, as well as read the guide to mandatory climate reporting? Thanks, Rose. Uh, so on the uh, AICD website, which is www.aicd.com.au, there's a section, uh, we are the host of the Climate Governance Initiative, which is um, the Australian chapter of a, of a global initiative uh, for climate governance for boards, and we're, we're hosting the Australian chapter. So on that website, you can find all our resources, including the Mandatory Climate Reporting Guide. The second edition came out only on Wednesday as well as our climate short course, e-learning and a range of other resources. So please welcome yourself to those and hopefully they're useful. Until next time then, I'm Rosemary Petrus and thank you for listening to The Green Away. The Green Away podcast is a product of FS Sustainability, a show about people, the planet and investing in our collective future. All information in this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only. The Greener Way podcast gives listeners access to information and educational content provided by discussing numerous financial sustainable options and our featured guests. It is not intended as a substitute for professional, legal or tax advice. The hosts of The Greener Way are not financial professionals and are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. For more information, head to the disclaimer page on the FS Sustainability website, fssustainability.com.au.